This presentation is in conjunction with the one by Dr. Uh, Stephen Tower dealing with cobalt encephalopathy. I'm going to start off with Arthur Clarke's three laws, which will concentrate on the first, la the last two. The only way to discover the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. And number three, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So if you're looking at these slides and they look a little bit strange, just think of them as magic and we'll keep on going. Or as uh, Dr. Honeydew in Muppets Lab said, this is where the future is being made today. In 1966, NBC debuted a science fiction program called Star Trek, and we were introduced to Starship Enterprise, which was a faster-than-light starship that utilized the power source of matter-antimatter reaction to power the warp engines. Now, the starship is still fiction, but every day around the world, the matter-antimatter reaction is being utilized to diagnose cancer, heart disease, and brain disease. And that's the PET scanner, positron emission tomography. Now, we are essentially looking at imaging of the metabolic function of the body as a CT type of image. And it's like a, a conventional nuclear medicine. We're injecting a PET isotope into the body and seeing how the body utilizes that isotope in metabolism. Now, the beauty about PET imaging is that we can directly image, say, an isotope such as fluorine 18, which goes to bone, or we can attach like a fluorine atom to glucose and see how the body uses glucose, the sugar to metabolism. Or we can actually incorporate one of these atoms into a molecule. If you wanted to know where Valium goes in the body, you could create Valium with a carbon-11 uh, atom in it and basically map the body met metabolically to see where the Valium was going. We're going to go into physics now, a real brief Magic 101. With unstable isotopes, it's because there's too many neutrons or too many protons in the nucleus, and the atom wants to become stable. And as we look here, you'll notice the fact is that the one-to-one -one ratio between neutrons and protons, as you get heavier and heavier elements, you need more neutrons to buffer that nucleus. Now, if you have too many protons in the nucleus, they want to change one of them to a neutron. So there's two ways of doing it. They can snatch an electron coming by. An electron plus a proton makes a neutron. Or the proton can eject an antimatter, a positively charged electron, out of the nucleus. And you take a proton, take away a positron, you've got a neutron. Now, F18, <laughs> this is, you know, there'll be no pop quiz after this one. <laughs> We create F18 in an atom smasher, and we basically drive an extra proton into the nucleus, making it uh, oxygen 18 into fluorine 18, and it wants to get rid of a positron. And so as it ejects it, it will slow down, and when it contacts an electron, as you know, uh, antimatter and matter completely converts to energy. And the rest energy from the equation by Einstein is e equals mc squared which means that there's complete equivalence between mass and energy. And the electron and the positron are both worth 511 keV, or 511,000 electron volts. So what's important about this? Well, as they shoot off, when they collect together and then they convert to protons, they go flying off at 180 degrees. And if you've got two detectors and they trigger simultaneously, we know that somewhere along that line was one of those interactions. And if we have a body in one of these three-dimensional areas and we get all these detectors going off, we can begin to create a three-dimensional image of the whole body. And it's what it looks like with the brain. We have an individual in the uh, scanner and we got the crystals around it and it's detecting where all of those uh, photons are going. So in summary, I'm going to leave the physics on this one, we have too many protons, ejects a positron, slows down, hits an electron, converted to energy, seen by detector, a whole bunch of detectors, when you create a three-dimensional image of the body. So what's good about positron emissioning? What's well, good for cancer, diagnosis of cancers, because cancers for glucose use three to five times more glucose than regular tissue. For heart disease, we can take a look at perfusion and function of the heart. And for brain disease, as a case here with Alzheimer's, we can map out the metabolic pattern of the brain to see if there's an abnormality. So what are we doing right now with the imaging we've been doing for the cobalt toxicity 
is using the standard workhorse in positron emission tomography. That's the F18 FDG. We take the glucose molecule and we put a fluorine into it. And the body sees that as glucose. So when you have a cell that needs glucose to keep metabolism, it'll see that FDG going by and it'll pull it into the system. Now it's interesting because in the next step is phosphorylated, getting ready to be made in energy. But from then on, the enzymes in the cell say, wait a minute, you're not real glucose. We're not gonna use you. But since it's phosphorylated, it can't go back out, so it's locked in. So now we have it trapped in the cell and we can detect it and see which, which way it's going, how much metabolism is in that cell in those areas of the body and those organs. So here we're talking about chronic toxic encephalopathy. And it's been studied predominantly with uh, organic solvents, which can easily pass the blood-brain barrier. We're looking at some of the metals that have been heavy metals that can cause poisoning, but even we sometimes don't know those mechanisms of how they get into the cell. There are three levels of toxicity of encephalopathy. The type one is the subclinical. Yeah, your memory may be lost a little bit. You may have some concentration problems or a mood change, and those are considered reversible. The next step is where you begin to get the early objective findings of something going wrong in the brain. And it could be, again, problems of real memory loss or attention deficits. And then finally, stage three, there are significant neurologic or neuroanatomic changes. Now, for the first two stages, we do imaging such as MR scans and, and CT to, make, to exclude something else causing the encephalopathy. Now, important factor. Type 1 and type 2 are considered reversible, but may not be because we have a reserve function in the body. And the problem is, if a patient recovers from encephalopathy, they may have lost that reserve because of toxicity. And later on in life, when you withdraw that reserve because you're getting older, it may not be there. So the symptoms could be resolved, say with surgery, but because of the loss of that reserve, reappear later on in life permanently. Looking at the metals can cause toxicity, the classic one is the disaster in Minamata, Japan in 1971. A manufacturing company dumped a large amount of methyl mercury into the river. It got into the water supply and into the food in the, in the bay. And, to, and the toxicity included multiple children. And that classic picture here by Smith from the Life magazine in 1972, severe neurologic damage to a lot of children in the village. We know about the Mad Hatter from Alice in Wonderland. They used mercury compounds to manufacture the felt that was used for the hat, the Mad Hatter. And also there's a thing called fire gilding in which you would dissolve gold into mercury, paint it on a surface such like a metal, like an iron dome here of the church. And then you'd use heat to vaporize the mercury to just keep the gold on the plating. And this is the cathedral, St. Isaac's Cathedral in St. Petersburg, Russia. They used that uh, technique. 60 workers died from direct mercury poisoning and about 200 others were permanently damaged. We know about lead from paint and from tetraethyl lead additives to improve octane and gasoline in the years past. You can get insomnia, delirium problems with cognitive decline. Interestingly, when you have a situation of toxicity of both lead and mercury, you have 10 times the punch. So there can be a potentiation of different types of uh, poisoning. Manganese can give you Parkinsonism and can give you a type of insanity called Okura Maganica. It can become permanent. And it's very interesting with manganese because it gives you a Parkinsonism, but it's not true Parkinson's disease because the two scans noted here, the F18 fluorodopa and the SPEC DAT scans will be normal with manganese but would be positive for uh, Parkinsonism with true Parkinson's disease. And then we have cobalt, which we've been dealing with, and that gives you the same process that's going on. You've got tremor, Parkinsonism, you've got problems with memory, problems with fine motor detail, you have tremor, you have a concentric loss of optical fields, key point. For OSHA and EPA, the toxicity for manufacturing is one part per billion. And right now they consider it could be potentially carcinogenic. With all these symptoms, we've coined the term the cobalt blues for these individuals. 
As mentioned by Dr. Tower, cobalt constitutes almost over 50% of the alloy in these prosthetic components between 46 and 65%. In 1981, Ray looked at all the different metals that are put in the body and noted that there'd be one combination that in a clinical environment could create significant toxicity. And that was the cobalt, cobalt chromium. This is 1981 when that was found. Now, going back to 1975, Jones had an article dealing with the toxicity in a local hip, including necrosis of tissue, bone and joint. There was no nickel or chrome patch test findings. That means there was no allergy to those two types of metals, which meant this was a chrome, this was a cobalt issue. Now, there's been recognition from all of this literature in orthopedics about the local findings and just a passing reference to the systemic findings, whether they be cardiac or for the, for the uh, brain. And mainly the focus has been on called metallosis, the adverse reaction to metal debris which includes pain and tissue necrosis. This is from a recent study from 2017 by Minna in Finland. And these are knees. And this is what it looks, it looks like. The left image there of tissue necrosis in a joint from the toxicity from the cobalt. And the fluid being removed from that same knee prior to the surgery, that mud is sterile necrotic debris coming out of the knee joint. Remember, we got five million people in the United States with artificial hips, many of them cobalt chromium. It would be nice to have a prospective study where we could start, start out with patients who are gonna be getting these hip prostheses or shoulders or knees and follow them over decades. But right now we're in the middle of five million people with these in place. So we don't have that luxury. We have to basically take a look at it now and see what's going on. The types of loss of metal, the mechanical type is called fretting. And this individual from Britain, basically was 57 years of age. He had it implanted for 52 months. Within one year of implant, he developed uh, the findings of confusion, irritability, memory loss, tinnitus, and constricted optical fields. His cobalt level was 65. Remember, the threshold's one part per billion. You can also get it from direct corrosion. And this is the metal and plastic type of prosthetic component. And there can be direct corrosion from an anodic, uh, anodic surface erosion or from a high pH. And when you put them together, it's called biotribology, just for your own reference. As, doc as Dr. Towers mentioned, there have been multiple case reports dating back to 2006. All these reports are consistent with similar findings of visual and hearing loss, uh, Parkinsonism, uh, polyneuropathies, cognitive decline, memory loss, tremor, and cardiac dysfunction. And as mentioned, we started off with 100 patients. Of those, two-thirds had elevated cobalt levels. We were able to scan the first 20. They had cognitive decline, ages between 51 and 83. We had a sort of same mix of men and women, and varying time with the prosthesis in place between almost five years and 27 years and relatively low cobalt levels, levels between 1.7 and, and 18 parts per billion. So how do we take a look at them? Well, we use two programs, and these are quantitative programs. It's not a subjective, I think this or I think that. These are cold, hard numbers coming out of computer program matched to individuals with normal brains, matched for age and sex. The first one is from the University of Utah. That's called Neurostat 3D SSP. Stereotactic surface projection, that is the work of Dr. Satoshi Minishima. The second one is NeuroQ, that's from UCLA, from Dr. Daniel Berman. They both utilize a reference of atlases and normal people. The top one basically gives us a look at the surface of the brain. What's happening in the brain can be manifest as changes to metabolism on the surface of the brain. And with the NeuroQ, we're actually looking at individual regions within the brain, deep in the brain. We can look at 240 different regions, which can be combined into 47 discrete clusters of important areas of the, of the brain. This is our first 16 patients. And with uh, the Neurostat, blue is bad. All these patients had a mild global hypometabolism with accentuated area over the vertex. And Neurostat is a, a program provided by the University of Utah for research and gave us that first good look. 
do we have something? Should we go forward? And that gave us the uh, confidence to go ahead and acquire the FDA approved uh, program, NeuroQ from uh, Incendermed. The whole body is affected by cobalt and the brain as a whole is also being poisoned by the cobalt. So we have reference regions we can use to compare normals to abnormals, but recognizing that the patient with cobalt toxicity, the entire brain is having hypermetabolism. So even though we may have normal look in some areas, it's actually abnormally low. So again, the projection is surface projection for Neurostat. And now NeuroQ, blue is good in NeuroQ, except when you get to the end there, you'll see some fuchsias and reds, and that's, that's bad in, uh, in, in NeuroQ. We have reference points in the, in the brain we can use to reference as a baseline. They can be the whole brain, it can be the thalamus, it can be the cerebellum, or it can be the pons for uh, neuro, uh, Neurostat, and also sensory motor added on for NeuroQ. The most resilient, but not completely resilient areas were the cerebellum and pons. And of the two, we chose the pons as the most conservative, resilient area to use as a reference for normals versus the abnormals. Now I'm gonna just pass briefly through these areas of decreasing importance. And you can take a look at these uh, numbers later on. But the key is we are able to split these patients into four different risk categories. Level one being the lowest and level four being the highest. The most affected region is the temporal lobes. And we see basically that as we have greater and greater involvement, and this is what we're doing, we're taking those 240 regions, summing the areas of abnormality, and then basically adjusting these patients into that category by the increasing amount of a global hypermetabolism, and then utilizing the cluster areas with a minus 1.65 standard deviation as being the threshold as the key difference for these, these individuals. So you'll see two numbers. You'll see basically aggregate, and then you'll see the standard deviations from the clusters. Temporal lobes, worse. Frontal lobes have followed that next. Cingulate regions come next, and this is important. For us, the anterior cingulate gyrus areas are affected sooner than the posterior. In Alzheimer's, the posterior are involved before the anterior. So we begin to get a separation between the two types of disease processes. Broca's areas. Also, you notice that sometimes there's an equality right to left. In some of these, you go back, you'll see that in certain areas of brain, the left side of the brain is more involved than the right side of the brain, depending on what the functions are. Parietal lobes. Again, pretty equal for all these patients from side to side. Basal ganglia. Again, Parkinsonism from cobalt is not going to be the same as Parkinson's disease, so we will not see the same affect within the basal ganglia and the visual cortex involved, both primary and associative. Thalamic areas. Okay, so we had all this data. We kind of compile it here. So we had those first 10 patients, a subgroup that had neuropsychology, uh, evaluation. One patient had two MOM uh, joints, one had one MOM, eight had the M metal on plastic. So now we have just not MOM type joints, but we have the safe MOPs in the same list. Of those, all had memory problems. Seven out of 10 had tremor, executive function compromise, four out of 10, mood, four out of 10. We had a sub, all of them, of a subgroup two, they all got to the general assessment of function testing. They all had abnormalities. And I also mentioned here the word affect. The staff at the imaging center, the technologists who inter, interfaced with these patients had a chance to take a look at them and deal with them. And these patients all had some sort of altered affect. Some were withdrawn, some were paranoid, some were grossly inappropriate to make a sailor blush, and some of them were just, as I say, chiroptera guino crazy. <laughs> so it was, it, was, uh, it was, to us, a kind of a separate fact to take a look at, what's, what they really look like. And Dr. Tara could comment more on that. So taking a look at all these patients together, we noted that there was a descending order of involvement, looking at temporal lobes followed by frontal, parietal, 
occipital, basal ganglia, caudate, thalamic, and visual cortex. Now these PET brain scans look worse than the patient at times because we're seeing subclinical disease. That's the beauty of PET because we can see disease before it becomes evident. With Alzheimer's, with PET imaging, you can see Alzheimer's two years before it becomes clinically evident. So we can actually peer into the future before this disease become clinically evident for patients. We were able to split them into the four groups. None of them had any significant neuroanatomic findings. And again, the metal and plastic, no different for the toxicity than the metal on metal. We've had mixed results after revision. A younger patient improved from a minus 96 aggregate score and a, and a, a, a cluster of four regions down to 40, minus 42 and 2. The second patient, number 24, it's a mix. The aggregate score got worse, but the clusters got less, kind of hanging there on the fence. And unfortunately, the other two bottomed out after the surgery. The revision did not help them. They got worse. So the worsening symptoms, I mean, we, were these changes from an irreversible toxicity? Remember, you can get to the point of even though you pull them away from the toxicity, it's going to stay and get worse. Or was it basically multiple combination of uh, underlying processes? Did, did the cobalt accentuate an underlying disease process? And together, one plus one equals five. <clears throat> so we have this data. And you go in the literature, and there's not much on using PET to take a look at toxicity in the brain from toxins. The only article I could dig up that dealt with nuclear medicine was a study from Calendar from 1993, looking at patients with these, these subjects that were exposed to pesticides. They had 33 workers. They all were considered to have abnormal brain scans. They had good correlation of the findings in relationship to the poor memory, the tremor, ataxia, anxiety, depression, and vertigo. And their sequence was temporal greater than frontal, greater, greater than basal ganglia, greater than thalamus, greater than parietal motor strip, and then down to occipital and caudate. Clark recently in 2016 used MRI and very advanced techniques of imaging to take a look at patients with minimally elevated to very low levels of cobalt and well-functioning cobalt prosthetic components. And they were able to find subtle changes in these subclinical findings on these patients in the area of the visual cortex and uh, basal ganglia. And Mito, I included this one because that used the 3D SSP program from Utah, looking at what Parkinson's looks like, real Parkinson's disease. So how do we compare ACE to a real chronic toxic encephalopathy as seen by Calendar? You take a look at the different percentages. They looked at it visually. They scored it visually because back in 1993, we didn't have the quantitative programming we have now to compare apples to apples. But if you take a look at it, the cerebellum is similar, the frontal lobes are similar, the parietal areas are a little bit worse on our side, the temporal lobes both show high involvement, and we're close on those. The basal ganglia, similar. So if you take a look at our sequence and their sequence, they're pretty similar, which means is what we're seeing with cobalt toxicity is the same as a regular chronic toxic encephalopathy as classically seen with solvents and other types of toxins. Taking a look at a Clark study with MRI, we've seen similar findings for the visual cortex and for the basal ganglia. Also, they didn't have any significant anatomic findings, nor did we. Taking a look at Mito's study, we found that we had areas of involvement which were seen with Parkinson's disease. So we can see that some of the areas of findings we see from the cobalt encephalopathy will affect the same areas that can create a Parkinsonism type presentation for patients. So in conclusion, we have a very straightforward scan we can do with the F18 bone, uh, brain scan. We inject the patient in a quiet room, uptake for one hour, scan them, and then do the uh, quantitative analysis. All orthoprosthetic components containing cobalt should be suspect for potential encephalopathy, not just metal and metal. 
Now, monitoring serum cobalt levels has been recommended by a lot of people. It may not be adequate for a complete evaluation and the urine cobalt becoming a significant addition. And the use of the cobalt and cobalt uh, alloys and prosthesis is a well overdue area for further investigation and clinical guidance using molecular imaging. It's to establish better thresholds for cobalt exposure, including industrial involvement, and also for other toxins that can cause damage to the brain. Now we have the ability to see damage before it becomes permanent. We can define monitoring protocols for patients that do have the prostheses. We can identify reversible versus irreversible thresholds. We can discriminate ACE from other pre-existing disease processes, a lot of these people are older. And we can evaluate treatment options and timing for a medical intervention versus a surgical intervention. And lastly, with alternative safer materials available, you know, commonly available such as ceramics, stainless steels, the advanced plastics and titanium. Further research may find that the continued use of chromium cobalt alloys for joint replacement may be unwarranted. I started the talk talking about a 57-year-old individual from Great Britain. I have one more 57-year-old I'd like to bring to your attention. This is a case report on clinical conjecture, but bear with me on this one. This was a 57-year-old male at the time of his death. He was very athletic, he even picked up basketball games when he was an adult, and he was very artistic. Medical history, childhood epilepsy, reports of the diagnosis of AIDS about six months before he passed away. He had significant orthopedic problems and in 2005 was recommended to have hip surgery. He was using a cane at that time. He did have the surgery in 2008, and we believe it was in England. But in the years after the surgery, the pain returned to the hip again, and he had to use a cane. And he had an opioid addiction. Now, was the opioid, opioid from recreational, or because of his profession and his need to be very athletic, was he basically using the opioids as a crutch to maintain his performance level? Uh, a Reels documentary from May of this year mentioned the fact that he was having major concern about memory loss. There was one theory that he had fibromyalgia. We're going to be we're thinking more cobalt, but anyway, th this discussion is a retrospective conjecture, and it's without extensive review of the medical liter literature on this patient, this history in this patient, because we don't have it right now. There are confounding comorbidities, however, taking into account the systemic effects and the potential toxicity, as we know from the literature and what we have seen with our research, that he may have had the adverse reaction to metal debris, and he could have had cobalt-induced chronic toxic encephalopathy. Now, did this accentuate the need for the pain medications? We'll never know. The individual was cremated. We don't know what happened to the, uh, the heart official hip. And other, other, other points too, we acknowledge the fact that the knowledge we now know cannot be applied retrospectively to judge the past, but hopefully help aid patients in the future. Because all that can be said right now is, rest in peace, Prince Rogers Nelson. Thank you very much.